Got it. Welcome everybody. I'm super excited that you're here. Um, welcome. We're going to do a webinar tonight and one that I'm really excited and super stoked about. Uh, we are doing the webinar tonight on the joint JD JIB program. That is our uh, joint Canadian common law and indigenous legal orders double degree or joint degree program. And uh, I am so we're so lucky you are, you are so lucky to have uh, some incredible people here with us this evening. I'll get into that into some introductions here shortly. Before I do, I thought I'd just better introduce myself. My name is Lori Claire. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I am a white settler woman on this incredibly beautiful land. And I would like, before I go any further, like to acknowledge this land that I'm on. So I acknowledge and respect the Lokongan people on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimo, and Hasanic peoples whose historical, historical relationship with the land continues to this day. And I say that, I like to, I like to do that acknowledgement, um, one, because it's important uh, for me professionally, but it is also really important for me personally because it reminds me uh, every day to extend gratitude to the First Nations people on whose land I live, I play, I love, and I've raised my children. Uh, and it reminds me to honor that land um, every time I am out and on it. So um, having said that, I'm actually going to ask people to introduce themselves here. I think that's probably better than me trying to do all the introductions. So I'm going to go uh, left to right, uh, as I see you on my screen. So as I call out your name, if you can do a quick introduction, that would be fabulous. So Val, super excited to have Val here, uh, Val Napoleon. Thank you, Laurie, for the acknowledgement as well as for organizing this event. It's always so important to build connections, maintain connections we have, and just see who's all uh, doing what and, and so on. So thank you. Um, uh, Val Napoleon, I am Cree and Daniza. I'm from Treaty 8, part of British Columbia. I'm from Soto First Nation. I'm also an adopted uh, member of the House of Lujan of the uh, Gitniao, the Northern Gixan Frog Clan. Uh, here at the university uh, in this law school, I'm the acting dean. I teach um, in the uh, Indigenous law degree program, the JD, JID uh, dual degree program. I teach property law, Gixan land and property law, along with Canadian property law. And I teach other stuff other times too. So there you go. That's my introduction. Thank you, Val. Rebecca Bryan, you're next. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see you. Hoping to get to chat to you a little bit later today. Um, so my name is Rebecca. Um, I'm a white settler originally from the treaty and traditional lands of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, so in Ontario, uh, currently living here on the Klungan territory. Very grateful to be back here. Um, and I'm a 3L in the JDJID program, and I was on the admissions committee last year. So if you have any questions about the admissions process, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. And my colleague, Ruth Young. Hi everybody, I'm Ruth Young. I am Cree from Wiminji on my mom's side, so that's James Bay Cree territory. Um, and I'm French, English, Irish, and Scottish on my dad's side. And I'm the Director of Indigenous Initiatives for the Faculty of Law at UVic. And thanks, Lori, for getting us together today for this session. And I hope to see some of your faces as we go throughout this. Emma? Hi, everyone. I'm Emma Edmonds. Um, my family came from Scotland and from Switzerland, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm on couch and territory today. And I am the senior admissions assistant for law, and today I'll be managing the chat. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to either raise your hand using that the function on Zoom or literally putting your camera on and raising your hand and, or putting it in the chat and I'll do my best to answer in there and we'll we'll be going back and forth it's going to be interactive tonight so thank you thanks for coming 
So I would like to turn it over to you um, and to ask you to perhaps turn your camera on, just introduce yourself quickly and um, yeah, just say hi. I'll go for it then. Uh, hi, I'm Nicole. I'm a Ukrainian and Dutch settler, and I'm tuning in from Sankey's and Xfimalt Lands. I'm in the Legacy Art Gallery right now. <laughs> Excited to be here. Eric, you're next. Hi. I think we met on Tuesday, but uh, yeah, just to reiterate for those who weren't there, for the uh, indigenous category. Uh, I'm a recent UVic business grad, currently living in East Van. And uh, yeah, excited to learn more about the JD program, JID program. Abby, it looks like you're next. Hi, my name is Abby. I'm currently in Halifax, so it's nighttime for me. So that's why my video is off, but. Yeah, I'm very thankful to connect with you all tonight, and I'm definitely very interested in the JID program and excited to learn more. Wow, welcome. Bradley? Hello. Uh, I don't actually have a camera, but uh, hopefully you can hear me well. Um, I'm from uh, Yellowknife, uh, Litsuke Dene First Nation. And yeah, I'm just uh, I'm currently going to school school in Edmonton at uh, McEwen, and just looking forward to hearing more about this program. And Dale. Hi, um, my name is Denesley Gale. Um, uh, I live in Vaughan, so this area is. Um, I'm not sure which indigenous region, to be honest. Um, I kind of like to learn more about that. Um, and my background as a settler is um, from the Philippine Islands. Wonderful, it's nice to see everybody and welcome everybody. Um, so this, this webinar is a little bit um, different. My hope for this webinar is that um, we can really talk to you about the JDJID program not so much the application process, although we can absolutely talk about that a little bit later on. What I'd like to focus the beginning part of this uh, webinar on is the JDJID program itself. Why was it developed? Uh, why is it such an incredibly unique and wonderful program? And why is it so necessary uh, for our local, national, and international communities? So I'm going to start off and I'm going to ask perhaps Val to um, introduce the conversation. Okay, well, this is this is so lovely to meet you and you're from your, well, meet uh, in from your different places through the screen. So one of the, you know, as, as uh, Lori has said, the program is unique. It's a four year uh, program. You, at the end of it, will have two law degrees. Uh, one in Indigenous law, which I will explain a bit more about, and then in the common law uh, as well. But before getting there, there's some really important starting ideas. And um, one is that you're not a people without law. Law is one of the ways that we govern ourselves. It's one of the ways that we create meaning in the world, um, it's one of the ways that we manage ourselves and the way that we take care of all of the, the messiness that is uh, what happens when human beings live together. Sometimes what I do, you know, when I'm meeting with judges or, or other folks, because there's so much curiosity about this program, there's interest and curiosity from right around the globe about what's going on here. And sometimes what I do is I ask people to just stop for a minute and just for a minute think about all of the ways that law is a part of your life, like how, like where you live, um, you're driving, <laughs> uh, where you can work, um, how we have families, how our families are constructed. Um, so a lot of our lives, uh, at least both informally and formally, has an aspect of law to it. So um, 
in terms of how we understand ourselves in a larger uh, citizenry, in terms of how we identify ourselves, in terms of how we relate to those of other citizenries, um, and how we manage conflicts, how we um, how we understand possession, how we understand ownership. Um, so these are all ways that law is an integral part of who we are. One of the things that law does is it constructs us as citizens. It, we are legal personalities. We're everything else too. We're spiritual, we're holistic, we're physical, we're all of these other wonderful things. But one of the things we are is a legal personality in terms of our obligations, in terms of uh, the rights that we have and who is going to uphold those rights if they were if they are uh, violated. So so law, we don't think about it a lot until there's a specific um, issue that comes up or you know often people will think of law in terms of institutions like uh, police or uh, you know um, courts or, other ministries that whose business it is to uh, manage, distribute law through our, through our land. So I ask people to think about all of the ways that law is a part of their lives and how they're constituted by law. And then I ask them to think about that's why it's important to Indigenous peoples too. And, you know, the history of Canada and the history of um, others around the world has been one of uh, that, that we know about. We know uh, some, at least some of the big pieces that have happened in our history and the rendering of indigenous law as invisible or um, being distorted or uh, being devalued. Those have major repercussions on indigenous peoples in Canada and elsewhere. And so when we think about that, and then we think about what are the different ways that Indigenous peoples are rebuilding their laws, rebuilding their legal orders. This is truly the most exciting work on the planet. I just got back from Nicola, where working with five communities up there on articulating water law from their histories, from their legal perspectives, from their legal orders, so that that can be visible in their relations with, um, so that when they're talking with government or looking at environmental assessment or anything else that they're doing, they, it's, it's, it's been made visible again in terms of all of its legitimacy and accountability and, um, and what makes law, law. So um, it's exciting work. The, the JID uh, program, I think, and I understand it as a part of this international rebuilding of, of Indigenous law, because, as I said, from my perspective and from the perspective of many, many others, it's central to being a people. Again, not the only thing. We have language, we have, you know, we have many other parts of our lives, but it's one aspect that is a distinct mode of governance that connects each of us as citizens in our societies and then enables us to relate to others from that basis of, of lawfulness. So that's part of why this program matters. Um, indigenous law hasn't gone anywhere, but it's been undermined. And, uh, and, and so, um, it still exists. It exists in terms of the oral histories, the precedents, the, in terms of how we treat one another through, you know, social interactions. Um, and bringing that forward from previous generations to this generation to deal with the problems of this generation, it's a way of understanding law itself as an intergeneral, intergenerational conversation. And that's the work that law has to do. It doesn't stay the same generation to generation, but each generation has new problems to solve. And so the idea of the JID is to bring this um, e explicitly uh, uh, to, to rebuild and to, to uh, introduce distinct areas of practice 
and theory so that people can once again see it as a as a uh, collaborative tool to manage parts of our lives our parts of our collective lives so um you know indigenous peoples you know in canada we've had different ways of relating to those who've come to these lands we've had treaties we've had uh, direct political action we've had all kinds of negotiations we've had litigation we've had many ways where peoples have attempted to, um, and, and, and some lots have been successful, but to, to relate to one another in ways that are healthy for everybody, not just for, you know, uh, for Canada, like at the expense of Indigenous people. So, um, and what we're seeing now with, with the work, um, like through the teaching and through the work that many Indigenous peoples are doing is that here's another way of building healthy, respectful relationships. And that's being able to think and to work across legal orders. And you can't do that in a vacuum. You can't do that in the abstract. You need to know what the laws are. You can't solve law and any human problems generally, like, you have to you have to be able to know uh, areas of of law and practice and what you you know um, what lawyers what law students learn in law school school is that they they stop looking at the law just from the outside from that sort of critical outside perspective and they get inside it to look at what are the aspirations and the logics and the ways that it actually works. So an internal perspective is necessary in order to practice law. Um, and that's what's needed for indigenous law as well, to have that internal uh, perspective. And so in the, the program, we have different subject areas and different legal orders that um, that comprise the, the whole thing. So I teach Gixan land and property law alongside uh, Canadian or common law property. And then I'm sure you've seen other descriptions. So the amazing John Burroughs teaches Anishinaabek constitutional law alongside Canadian constitutional law. Uh, Darcy Lindbergh, who you've met, is, you know, he's currently coordinating the field schools, which are part of the upper year programs. We have Al Hanna, who's Blackfoot, who uh, teaches uh, Tsilkotin contracts as well as Canadian contracts, so that all of the courses uh, are double courses. So there's, there's how is this subject area dealt with in, and what are the precedents and, and processes for dealing with it? Uh, in different legal traditions? And then how do we understand and work across where we have to? And it's not easy, it's really, it's hard work because there are different economies. Economies give purpose to law. There are uh, different uh, in, in structures of societies. There are um, any number of things that require careful thinking, but that's the exciting stuff. So. So the first two years of the JID is, um, are those what we call trans-systemic courses. Um, and then in the upper years, we also have um, additional trans-systemic courses that we're, we're creating for students. And then in the third and fourth years, we have the field schools. So, um, so this is, um, to, give, to give you an example, like so today or yeah, it was today in class, uh, one of the students as part of her reflection um, on, they have to do reflections on readings. So what she did was she took a Gixan story of the gentle people, Hagelgut, the gentle people. And she took a, a, a really old um, common law case and they, they both had to do with water, uh, rivers, um, and in the Hagelgut uh, story, they had to do with the, the fish, fish uh, salmon. And what she did was this amazing analysis of looking at, okay, so here are the underlying 
principles at play here. And here are the outcomes. And then she did the same thing with, with the Gixan one. And it was, and you can see different principles, different outcomes, um, and then how much you imagine a conversation across those cases. You know, and this is the kind of work that communities are doing, like with the different water projects. You know, they're wanting to look at how can we operationalize indigenous law in this world to take care of water flow, take care of fish, take care of all of the things that are really important here. And how do we manage the conflicts that are inevitable with any of those areas of our lives? So um, should you come and join us in this uh, law degree program, you'll have to work really hard, but everybody works hard. Um, but that's the kind of work you'll end up doing. It's new work. It's new lawyering. It hasn't been done before. And so, I mean, the other part of my job is to do as much education as I can with law firms and with everybody else so that they can appreciate the, the abilities and the skills of, of the students that are graduating from here. So I hope you have some questions. Go ahead, this is an opportunity you don't wanna miss. And feel free to use the chat or um, just jump in um, with your voice too. <laughs> I have a quick question. I, oh, okay, you can go oh, ahead. Sorry. You no, can go you, ahead. You, you, you first. Oh, okay. Um, so the reason why this program um, specifically draws me in um, because it's very unique in the sense that I think it's the first time I've ever seen um, the practice of law being uh, recognizing the Indigenous perspective. Um, and as a, a settler, an immigrant, um, it's always been really difficult for me to kind of reconcile why I moved to this country. Um, when my when I have when like my island, the islands of the Philippines beautiful paradise, um, but just the structure in which like the government is made it's very hard to live there, and so that's why my parents decided to move here and and so like bridging these and like weaving the story of like humanity and law and colonialism in general, um, I guess like from your perspective um, because this this program the indigenous legal orders that um, this program will focus on is mainly, um, what do you call this? Like Canadian context, Canadian nations. Um, how, uh, is there any way for me to kind of bridge these gaps also in like a global context? Cause my, uh, this is a very ambitious thing for my desire at least is to see change in my, in the Philippines um, and to see indigenous people have um, a personality because they're, Basically, it's ethnocide there as well. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Um, one of the things that I talk to the students about when I teach the Gixan law, or when I'm teaching Gixan or Cree law, or um, you know Daniza, or you know whatever legal tradition we're working with, the expectation is not that that student is going to become an expert in all of Gixan law, right? The rather, what that student is going to have is enough grounding in what makes law law, in, in what are the essential um, um, functions of law in a society and scope of law in that society, and then what are the elements that are required for it to operate as law. Okay, so that's you know a, a working framework. It's a it's a way in that can be transferred, right? So you can you can look then for elsewhere. Who are the authoritative decision makers? Where is the the common memory held? Where does the precedent come from? Um, what are the legal obligations? What are the legal guiding legal principles? So you can take the work of one approach, one methodology, and there's there's many methodologies. I don't want to suggest there's, there's just this one. Um, there's linguistic, there's land-based, there's um, 
there are other ways of learning and teaching law. And you can take that and apply it elsewhere. So one of the most interesting examples is we taught, my colleague and I taught a course in um, Indigenous human rights. So what we were looking at are what, from within this legal tradition or these, we were working with three different legal traditions. What are the concepts of dignity and inclusion and fairness? And, um, and how, um, how are these, understood and acted on from, from the different perspectives. And there were students from different religious groups like Hutterite as well as Mennonite groups who were part of that course, who took the methodology and applied it to their stories, right? So they were looking at how can we, how can we uh, constructively ask questions about male dominance in the stories and sexism in the stories? How, what, and so what they were doing was taking um, the tools for thinking and applying it in a different context, which I thought was just brilliant. I thought it was, uh, and I think that there's, there's more that can be done that internationally. I mean, we work I've, you know, with folks in, um, uh, Sami folks, with uh, folks in Australia, with folks in New Zealand, like, so there's, that's where the questions are coming from and people are wanting to know so what might work what are the issues and um, you know you have to account for different state legal orders as well as different histories but it's doable it's all doable eric you had a question I did. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Napoleon. It's really nice to be able to see someone who's kind of high, super high up in the program. It's cool. Um, I was hoping that you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, the field school from perhaps like a, an administrative perspective, whether that's like a specific course and also the kind of material that they typically discuss. Yeah, so one of the things that um, you know when you when you when you take a common law degree or a civil law degree uh, law degree, <laughs> um, you already have the foundations for those degree programs in the world around you. You have law libraries, you have um, recorded cases, you have, case reports, you have um, uh, whole um, uh, bureaucracies that are, um, that contain professionals as well as um, different roles and responsibilities, all of which are part of common law or civil law in this country. What we don't have, and so it's, so you can get summer work, at firms, you can you can get all you know these different kinds of experiences. When we're looking at indigenous law, we don't have the same kind of libraries and resources. We don't have the same kind of uh, law firms that can take you on and provide certain kinds of experiences that we believe would strengthen the the um, legal education. Um, and so, what we wanted to do was to try in the program to build in. Uh, two components of legal practice where students are in real life situations with different communities. And we set up those uh, arrangements in, in partnership with those communities because we don't want to ever cause fatigue to communities that for the most part are still under-resourced and um, have so many demands already being made upon them. So, um, so the field schools are developed in collaboration. They take, they take a, quite a few months to set up because it means many meetings with people in those communities. It means talking with people in different roles of governance and, and um, other uh, parts of, of the community to look at, okay, so what would be helpful? What would be important for, for you to, uh, that students could do under the supervision of, of a professor and with, with support. 
And we uh, also uh, try to make sure that we hire somebody from that community to be like a, a co-teacher. Um, co so the field schools uh, vary depending on the priorities of the communities we're working with, as well as how many communities actually end up being a part of the field school. Um, the, right now, the, the ones that we're looking at, one is going to for January, one is in the interior with the Sikwepmek, and the other will be up island. And, uh, and so we, we have people from those communities who are working with us uh, on putting together that whole program. Students do different kinds of things. So in the last field school, which was in many ways an anomaly because of the pandemic, Students uh, drafted uh, uh, different kinds of agreements, you know, concerning child welfare and housing and governance and, and so on that are important to the community, uh, the community's uh, life and responsibilities, but also for their relationships with um, Canada. And, um, and they, it's, you know, it's, it's sometimes um, hard for students to see that those are also Indigenous law. They're founded on uh, Indigenous obligations. They're founded on um, you know, uh, Indigenous institutions, whether they're clans or families or, or uh, other groupings. And so those, um, uh, the, the work that the students complete varies. You know, it could be fisheries, it could be forestry, it could be different things. We're also looking at um, a national model where we have, we can provide more of a range of uh, work uh, learning experiences at uh, different places and organizations across the country. And then one of my hopes is that we can start uh, get enough resources and support so that we can develop an international field school so that, so that there's a, <clears throat> Pardon me, I have allergies, it's not, <laughs> anyway. Um, so that there can be a range of experiences for students. You know, it's early days. Um, these in January will be our first in-person field schools. And so, you know, it's in some ways it's like learning to fly the airplane while you're building it. It's, we don't quite know how everything's gonna work. We'll, we'll learn a lot. Um, we'll probably learn some things we'd rather we didn't learn, um, but there you go. So that's the field schools. Thank you. Um, can I ask one smaller question? Mm -hmm. uh, just now you said um, international field schools. Would that be like doing a field school, but with an indigenous community in another country? Yeah. So, hey, I just want to say that right now, this is an intention and a dream, but the world is run by intentions and dreams, right? You have to imagine it. We all behave and in the world we understand to exist. And so I figure if we start talking about an international field school, just the same as we started talking about a JID, it's gonna happen. I just can't say when right now. <laughs> Thank you. so much, Val. I'm wondering if, um, Ruth, if you want to jump in and talk about the JDJID, your role. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I, I'm also cognizant that Amanda came in and I would want to give the opportunity for students to also, for the students who are here to learn about the program, to hear from students of the program. So I'm happy to answer questions as they come up. But Amanda, if you wanted to introduce yourself and then if the other students here wanna ask Rebecca or Amanda questions, to have Val here is amazing and to have students here to ask for their experiences is also wonderful. So maybe I'll just let Amanda introduce herself and if I can jump in at any point, I definitely will. Thanks, Lori. Sure, um, hi everybody. I hope you can hear me, thumbs up. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, sorry I'm late. I am, my name's Amanda. I'm from Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation on my, on my dad's side, and I'm from uh, Six Nations of the Grand River uh, on my mom's side, Mohawk Nation. Um, I am a student at 3L in, in the JID. I am also a mother. 
a uh, single parent. And so that's why I'm late because I had to get my girl. Uh, and I do a lot of volunteering with her school, which I'm thinking, why did I do that? Because it's crazy and we have so much work to do already. And I took on even more work. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the Indigenous Law Students Association. So we had that meeting today and getting that all wrapped up. So I have a lot going on. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry I missed everybody's intros, but life of a student and a mother at this point in time. Thank you, Amanda, and I'm sorry I missed you. Thank you for your introduction and thank you so much for being here. It's fabulous. Rebecca, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Um, sure. I mean, I already did. So um, I'm a settler originally from Ontario, currently here in Lekwungen territory. Um, I'm a colleague and friend of Amanda's, um, and so we're happy to be here to answer your questions. I have a question, sorry, before I jump in, before, I just thought it might be helpful. I always talk about, um, when I'm out recruiting for students, I always ask them to sort of talk about their journey to law school. So I'm wondering if, if you and Amanda and Rebecca, if you guys, if you're comfortable or want to talk about why the JDJID instead of the JD, for example, and then maybe perhaps just give the students a little bit of a, an idea of how, how did you end up at UVA Law? <laughs> like who's going first? <laughs> Alrighty, so a um, little bit about me. I worked as a uh, online, uh, I worked for a publicly funded organization that promoted online and distance education. Uh, when I first graduated from university way back when, almost a decade and a half ago. Um, and I had always, you know, like when I was 18 years old and trying to, to decide what I was going to do with my life, um, I saw this flyer for a university that I wanted to go to. So I was like, all right, that's where I'm going to go. Um, so, I, But I had originally started out in life going to be a lawyer. Uh, it just took me a little bit of time to get there. Um, and so I did a program and court and tribunal agent for two years. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to this university because I like the ivy on the buildings and their limestone and it was really beautiful. And so I went there um, and then I graduated and from there. And then I started working um, in the, the online stuff. And then I became the director of education uh, for my community for almost eight years. Um, I had my daughter in that period of time and, but, backing up a little bit when I graduated uh, from university, I had thought, you know what, like, I'm going to go to law school, but I just wasn't ready at that time. And of course, at that time, you know, there was, I, I think we had just started the conversation, whether it was, um, whether it was First Nations or whether we were Aboriginal people, like that, that was the big thing at the time. Um, and so, you know, I thought, there's nothing really for me at any of these law schools right now because um, I don't see how it could, you know, assist me in furthering uh, our people, my people. Um, and so when I was growing up, we had this, you know, I guess you would call it an obligation um, through all of our teachings. Uh, we had this responsibility that our nation would invest in us to and, and put us through school, but we had to return that investment, right? We had to reciprocate and we had to do something that would help our people. Um, and so in the 2000s, when I graduated, uh, there was nothing, you know, that I felt that was going to be for me in furthering um, the agenda for Indigenous peoples uh, in Canada. And so over this period of time, like I was working, I was meeting people, I was going to, to national events uh, as a director of education. And I had come across, you know, various people. Um, and I had met this lady, her name is Sharon Venn. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, Google her and check her out. Um, she's a Cree woman from Alberta. And she really had a, a, an impact on me uh, already knowing that I was going to do something that would assist our, our people in the future. Uh, but she came to me and she said, you know, um, and to Gail's point here and to Eric's question about, you know, internationally, can this be applied internationally? Um, and so she told me, she said, you know what, like you, you need to go into law, but you need to wait until it's the right time. And you need to go into a program that's going to help our people. That's going to give you the skills and ability to help our people. And so I waited. 
Um, and so when this program came out, I got a flood of emails saying, you need to go to this program, you need to go to this program. Um, and so I did, I, I applied, and um, this was the only law school that I chose. And um, thinking back to that conversation that I had with Sharon, you know, she had said that we as Indigenous people will never get support from, from Canada or the United States, and that we need to be thinking internationally and making connections uh, with people internationally, um, because that's where our support is going to come from. If, if we want to really advance, we have to be on an international scene. And so, you know, I, I really took that to heart and listened to, um, to, to my heart at the time, you know, and decided to wait. And so when this program came out, um, I applied and I was actually accepted into the first cohort, but I couldn't, I couldn't be a part of that cohort because I had, you know, family issues that I had to sort out. And so, um, yeah, I, here I am, you know, I deferred for a year, waited a year. Um, and I was so, you know, grateful thinking that I would never, you know, really come to law school, but, uh, Hey, you know, the time was right. And this is where I was meant to be. And that that's my journey to Ubic Law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing. That's, uh, that's fabulous. That's an awesome. Awesome. I'm so glad you're here. Rebecca. Well, I don't know how I can follow that at all, um, <laughs> but also glad that you're here, Amanda, and also glad that you that you deferred, because um, then obviously we can build relationships together. And yeah, so grateful to be in the program with you. Um, so I'm pretty new to law. Um, I never thought I would go to law school. I didn't think I wanted to go to law school. I didn't want to be a lawyer um, just because of a lot of negative stereotypes in the media about who lawyers are, um, but I, accidentally got a job at a law firm when I graduated university. Um, and I, I kind of enjoyed the process of um, the legal field, but I didn't enjoy where I was working necessarily, the field I was working in. Um, and so I did a lot of learning during that time. I did a lot of reflecting. Um, I read some um, indigenous constitutional books by Dr. John Burroughs, uh, which was very helpful. Um, and then I got a job at an Aboriginal law firm in Toronto um, and then started working with them and became um, really a huge fan of the work that they do and the dedication they have to um, their Indigenous clients and the work that they're doing um, and kind of pushing back against colonialism, um, especially in terms of child protection, which um, is an area that I am really interested in. Um, and then the program was announced. And so I said, okay, well, I guess we're going to law school if we can. Um, and UVic was definitely um, the first and only real choice that I, I was really hoping. I wasn't sure if I would get accepted. Um, and then I'm so grateful to be here and frankly, very honored. Um, and it's an amazing opportunity to be here. All the people in the program are absolutely fantastic and wonderful human beings um, who are really incredible and come from very different places. And it's such an honor to learn from them and also from all the professors. So it's, uh, it's amazing. If you, if you decide to, to apply and then want to come, um, we'd love to have you. So hopefully we can see you next year. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'll open it, I'll, I'll stop talking. And oh, as we, you know, you've got the students here, ask them questions. I have another question, if that's okay. Um, so I guess mine is a little bit more of a personal question because um, one thing that has really been a fear of mine in terms of practicing law is just the amount of, um, uh, I guess, like pushback that you, you get um, and just the amount of work required um, to continue pursuing, you know, acts of justice and truth to be embodied in reality. Um, and so navigating the the chaos of all of this um how do you build that sense of resiliency um within yourself uh to continue practicing and to ensure you know the dreams and visions and desires that you have for future generations how do you continue that spirit within yourself um without burning out um and that's something that i'm trying to like learn how to do um, to pursue this career. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good question. 
Uh, it's also, I think, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure like how to answer that. Um, for me, you know, in my journey, um, getting here, I think, you know, I, I look to my family, you know, my family supports me being here. My family's done a lot to help me get here. Um, I rely on my family. And really, um, once I had my daughter, you know, my daughter was really the, I have to do more for her. You know, I have, I have to do good for her. We have to be reconciling with Canada. We have to be doing what we can. I have to be able to secure those rights for my daughter, you know, and I have to make things better. Um, so I think for me, that's what, what helps me. Um, I think being an Indigenous person um, in the practice of law at this point in time is we're at like a really pivotal, pivotal, pivotal moment where a lot of good can come from our positions um, as well, you know, the, the being in a, a degree that is the first in the world is helpful as well because it's it really gives us a leg up, right, so that we can take those principles and apply them in the work that we do, um, even if it is in the summer. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, like in terms of um, being involved in you know, extracurricular things um, or, or causes or, or fighting for justice, like, you know, you kind of have to pick and choose like what you're going to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, that my best advice would be to, you know, like you, you, it, 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 is, it is a lot of work. <laughs> and if you have time for that, that's great. But, you know, you have to do what you got to do and, and follow where your heart, you know, takes you. Um, and yeah, just let your heart be your guide, I guess. <laughs> yeah, just alongside that, I'd say that the, I would, I'd say the group of students at UVic Law are quite engaged and involved in a lot of activism in the area. And it's just reminding students, like Amanda said, to pick your battles. Um, you have to know what's ahead of you. Um, and we remind students, or I remind students a lot who come into my office that are feeling like they're burning out, that they're on a journey here to have a tool in their toolkit that they can help their community or Indigenous people generally um, further along the way when they have a law degree in the end. Um, so to not stray too far from that pathway and that journey, I mean, there are definitely things you can get involved in along the way. But to remember there, there are others who can also be there and, and put their bodies on the line and it doesn't always have to be you. Um, so keeping in mind, you know, what are your priorities? Um, what is your commitment to the program? And, you know, what, what can you not let go? And there will be some that you can't let go and that you're going to have to go to and you might have to talk to your profs, you might have to talk to other people, the support folks at UVic Law to say like, what can I do here? This is really important to me um, and, and talk through those things. Um, but definitely Amanda had some great advice there. Choose your battles, choose them well, um, but don't lose sight of your goal in the end because that, that law degree, that's what's gonna really serve you well. And we see some, some folks with law degrees coming back and supporting the students that are also on the line. Um, and they're, they're the ones who are offering really amazing advice. So. Just keep that in mind. I just wanted to add to that too. I heard a, a nice quote today, um, a reminder about when you feel like you're hitting the wall, that sometimes walls are there so that we can lean on them and rest. I thought that was really nice. And, and I also just want to kind of reiterate what Ruth said, that there's a really great community at UVic Law as well, and a lot of resources um, to reach out if you need. If you need to lean and rest, if you're hitting the wall. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I can't tell you what an opportunity this is and how lucky we are to have Val, Ruth, Amanda and Rebecca here with us. So uh, we're a fairly small group. Uh, you know, don't be shy. Feel just, you know, if you've got any questions about this program, just throw them out there or put them in the chat. So I'll add a tiny bit. It doesn't relate to um, 
to, to you necessarily, but it will relate to your grandmother or your mother <laughs> or your grandparents. Um, I came to law school when I became a grandmother. So I had a, I had a life and a career and all of that prior to law school. And what I found was that um, it's pretty sexist in lots of uh, indigenous communities. And for women, a law degree makes a difference um, in terms of not being sidelined, in terms of maintaining the kind of work that we want to do. Um, and insofar as the kind of sexist politics that are a reality that we haven't yet changed, um, it's, uh, it is a, it's an important tool um, for getting along in the life and making sure that our daughters and our, and our, you know, I have four grandsons, making sure that they are able to participate in a world that will welcome them. So these, these are all um, important uh, aspects so here's the thing, if you have a grandmother who might be interested in law school or your mother, <laughs> tell them to apply too. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about the types of work that we've done. Um, okay, so I, I applied to the, I mean, I've applied to big firms, I've applied to small firms, I've applied to civil liberties, I've applied to many different areas. Um, and there are, I guess, some people who don't even work in law um, in their summers. Uh, but I have worked for two summers with the Ministry of Attorney General in the Criminal Division um, in various, uh, I mean, my first summer, I listened to bail hearings all summer. Um, I wrote a lot of memos and that's, you know, you'll learn how to write memos in, in your first year and maybe in your second year, but you'll do a lot of writing. Um, and so I, I worked on that. And then this past summer, I summered again in the criminal division. Um, and this year I actually got to lead court. I was um, responsible for running the indigenous people's court and youth court every other week, they rotate it. Um, and then every week I run remand court, um, which is if you don't know what criminal law, um, the remand court is just where people come and they, they get adjournments for their case. Um, answered questions about their cases and helped as well um, researching. I did sentencing research um, for people who were in, in at the end of their trials kind of, and then I did um, just other, you know, very narrow research questions. I can't even think of the, the really narrow one that I did. Oh, I, I think I came with like around discovery and inevitable discovery if something's going to be eventually disclose, but what are the timelines on, on that disclosure? Um, and so that did cool stuff like that. Um, and so next year, I think I'll summer again um, with Meg and eventually probably article with them and probably go on to become a Crown Attorney. Um, but I think too, like how would I use what I've gained here in that position to assist the communities that we're working with and helping them to um, assert their sovereignty over uh, doing their own type of um, criminal courts in their community. How can we give that back to them and give them that authority to deal with their own offenders in, in a really good way? Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, if you have any questions about working with Meg, like let me know, I'll put my email in the chat. You can email me or call me or whatever. Um, I could probably talk for days about it, but I'll cut, I'll cut it there. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Thank you. Uh, I was just gonna ask Amanda if, if those, uh, if those work positions you had, if those were co-ops or were those like full-time, but how did that, how did that work? Yeah. So, and I think, um, because we're in the JID, we're not eligible for a co-op, but if you were yeah. in the JID, then you, you were, you are eligible for co-op. Um, but no, like those are just uh, summer positions. So you start, you know, you finish school for the term for the year and then, um, you start in May and then you work. May to August full time. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're either you're in court uh, in the trial division, which is where I was, uh, you're in court every single day. Um, or, you know, 
a lot of it was done by Zoom this past year because of COVID. Um, and so I actually didn't really like get that trial process because that stopped, right? And so now they're restarting those trials. So this year was a, a, a lot different um, than it was the previous year. But yeah, you, you apply for it and there's different time periods and stuff at different firms that hire. So um, you just go through all of that when, when you get there. <laughs> okay, so even though there's no co-op program, um, there's lots of work opportunities? I would say so, yeah. Like there's yeah. there's always um, the law career office, like they send out an email every week with different jobs that are available. Um, you can do placements in the summer. You can probably work part-time if, if you choose. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities that come up. We do have a law careers officer and an assistant as well who can help students with those kinds of placements. And it's true, like as Amanda said, students in the JID can't get a co-op designation, but students in the JID can actually apply for some co-op positions that are open. So anyone can apply. You can do a co-op job. You just can't do enough to get a co-op designation on your degree. So you can compete for the co-op jobs. The issue is though, after your first year, the first year JDs have contracts and torts. And so you can, if in your first year, after your first year, you can only compete for the jobs that don't require contracts and torts because you won't have those until your second year. Um, in your second year, you would be able to apply for those. So you have to kind of connect with our co-op team and ask them which jobs are available to you and you can compete for those, for those positions. Thank you. Bradley, you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering if these uh, job prospects uh, relate to like just Victoria itself. I was just hoping to live there year round if I enter the program. Just wondering how that works. There are positions in Victoria for sure, but there are, they, they work with um, folks across Canada. And I'm, I'm sure there are some internationally as well. Um, but um, yeah, there are some based in Victoria, Vancouver, as well as across Canada. And the LCO, they post like across Canada. So anywhere where you're looking, even if um, you have a specific area, like say you're from like somewhere in the north and it's really specific, like they'll, if you tell them, like they'll help you, they'll look for um, jobs in your area. Go ahead, Abby. Hi, um, my question is a little bit off track of the conversation we're having right now, but um, one hesitancy I have about the program is I am someone who identifies as a settler and um, the hesitation I have is applying and then taking a space from an Indigenous person. And I'm just wondering if you could talk more about the dynamics within the program between those who identify as settlers and Indigenous and just your experience with that. I don't know if Amanda and Rebecca want to respond to that. I will say that um, part of the admissions group, because I am on the admissions committee for the JDJID program, when we get applications, we do um, consider all applications on a whole, in a holistic way. Um, and we do intentionally try to ensure that at least 50% of the group, come, the cohort coming in is Indigenous. Um, but there is lots of space for non-Indigenous folks too. Um, there are definitely dynamics at play, and I feel like Rebecca and Amanda might be better placed to answer that specific question. I'll go first, I guess. Um, you know, like Rebecca said, we all get along. There are, I, yeah, I would say like there's probably 50% in our cohort that, as well that are Indigenous and the other 50 are not. Um, I don't think there's any major problems uh, with that, you know, if as long as your your intention, you know, is to be like a good ally and 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 to help, you know, I think in the spirit of helping Indigenous people, then I think that's that's awesome. And I think that's where most of the people in our cohort and even in the people in the upper year and and the one L's and two L's now, like I think that that's where they're at. I really agree with that. Um, and that's something that I also thought about, um, but they actually didn't fill the class in my year. So the committee is very careful in kind of looking at the applications and, and reading them to kind of see um, what your experience is and, and looking at your personal statement as well as your community connection. 
Um, and so I think for me in my kind of journey, it's um, coming from a good place and being really committed to learning and kind of learning intellectual and cultural humility. I mean, kind of recognizing that I do have a lot of work to do, um, but I am very willing to take that on um, and to support my colleagues wherever possible. Um, so um, from, from what I've heard from other people, um, some other professors is that um, it's important for all of us to do this work because there is so much work to do. Um, and so you're not taking a space, it's just that you're kind of coming from a different um, life experience that can also be useful in this work. So that's a perfect segue for me. I just wanted to ask, and I'm going to throw it out to Val, Ruth, Rebecca, and Amanda. Um, I get asked a lot about cohort-based learning and what is it like being, so we had, for those of you who may not know what I'm talking about when I say cohort-based, we admit 25 students into the JD, JID program each year. So I'm wondering, again, Val, Ruth, Amanda, Rebecca, if you guys, what is it like in a, co in a small class like that? Uh, what, what are the values? What are the challenges maybe? So I can speak, first of all, perhaps to, um, to what we're looking at, which is to uh, open up at least uh, one course a year, uh, probably constitutional and property, to open up the, uh, those courses to applications from JD students to attend so that um, through those courses, there will be connections with uh, students in the, in the JD program. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, sort of background and thought that's gone into that, including, um, you know, what uh, what Amanda and Rebecca have spoken to that we do have to work together. Like nobody's living in isolation in Canada, and um, so so how do we learn to do that? And and the 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 more people who have that. Uh, ability to understand multi juridical Canada and <clears throat> ways to uh, to be supportive um, across the, the the demands, the better. I mean, it can it can only help. So, um, so that's what we're going to be trying over this next uh, while. Um, and there are there are pros and cons. I mean, from a professor's perspective. I love having a group of 25 people. You have, you have an opportunity to build relationships, to see dynamics, to see what's missing, where supports are needed. Uh, and there's a collective kind of excitement that you can, you can experience. And it's harder when there's you know, 50 students or, or more, it's harder to, to maintain those kinds of connections. So there's pros and cons, I think, to, um, to different, different approaches. Thank you. Um, from, from my end being, so at, in my role as Director of Indigenous Initiatives, I'm not necessarily a frontline staff member, but a lot of students will come and talk to me about some of these dynamics in the classroom um, and in the cohort. And I think it's a pretty um, unique and I don't wanna say special is precious, but a special, kind of relationship that ends up uh, developing with a cohort. There are definitely tensions. I mean, if you are part of a big family, um, you know, you'll have your favorite sibling and you'll have the one sibling who's left out and you'll have all those and that'll grow and change and then change again. Um, and then everyone's really happy and then everyone's really sad. Um, so, I mean, it's, it is like a family relationship. And when I think crisis hits or something difficult hits. I have seen how even tension, students with tensions have held each other up and held each other together. Um, and so it's actually quite beautiful. It's also quite difficult. Things, when they hit deep, they hit real deep. And when you're on a high, you're on a real high. And so it's, it's just, I think, as I said, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. But I think and in the end, you know you have a group of folks that you can really count on who will hold you up in the end. Because I think at the base of things, everyone has some kind of 
core or base or foundation that is just wanting to support these things moving forward. Um, whether they agree on everything or not, well, they don't agree on everything. Um, but there is there is a family dynamic there and a, an understanding of support. So that's at least my perspective as a like staff member in there and not a student in the middle of it. <laughs> Rebecca, do you want to? From the student side of things, um, so in first year, you take some courses, you go through legal process, which is a two week thing um, where everybody's like, you know, all over the place. And so you don't really know who's in your cohort until like week three, or if you meet people um, during that legal process, you know, sit everywhere, meet lots of people. That would be my advice. Um, so yeah, you, you take legal process, you meet other people in the JD program, and you'll become friends with them. And then once you kind of transition into regular classes, then you get to know your cohort. And, you know, like Ruth said, it's a family, people have growing pains, you know, there's people politics. And so I don't think that's, you know, any different than in any of the cohorts. I'm sure all of the cohorts have experienced that. Um, in terms of the learning, I think it's great because we all learn from one another, whereas in a larger class, you know, I'm thinking of my criminal procedure class, like I know five people in the class, but we've never gotten to introduce ourselves to anybody else. And so you really get to know, you know, like who, who you're working with, right? And you make some people you make good connections with and other years you don't, and that's fine too. Um, and so, yeah, like there are pros and there are cons. If we're hearing, you know, the same story again for the fifth time, then, you know, <laughs> it gets a little like that. But I think for the most part, um, we always, always have something different to talk about or different thoughts pop into our head when we're learning different things or we're analyzing different things or, or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I, I like the small groups, but I also like you know, the larger groups. And so um, I think once you get into your third year, you know, and you have more electives that you can choose, um, then you realize like, oh, hey, you're in third year. How come I didn't meet you in first year? Like yesterday or Tuesday when me and Rebecca were sitting in class, you know, I was like, oh, hey, James, what year are you in? He's like third year. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never met this guy. <laughs> so, I mean, there's things like that, that will come up too. Right. So as much it is, as much as it is, as it is awesome, like being a small group, um, you know, then I feel kind of bad that at the same time, I never got to meet, you know, somebody like James until three years later. So there's good and there's bad. And just to kind of echo what Amanda's saying, a lot of us are moving, you know, from faraway places across the country, even some people might be moving from international places. And so you're kind of with, left without roots. And so part of the beauty of being in a small cohort is that you can kind of build those connections and those people to rely on, which is really wonderful. Um, obviously, you know, we're all human. Um, so there's always kind of ups and downs is what Ruth was saying. Um, but overall, like, I feel incredibly lucky to know all the people who are in the program um, and to work with all the professors. So, um, yeah, I think it's also great that we can then go outside and be in the JD cohort as well and, and meet them because they're also wonderful folks. Um, they're just kind of in a different program. So, yeah, it's a good experience. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, does anybody have any questions? On Perhaps I can talk about mooting. Does either Val or Ruth kind of want to set that up for me? Sure. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, mooting is, uh, it's one of the ways that uh, students are introduced to uh, one of the uh, legal practices, like so the opportunity, uh, again, in different subject areas, because there's numbers of different kinds of moots. Um, uh, it's an opportunity to, uh, to do the research, develop an argument and, and have and develop the oral advocacy skills. So there's different, there's a range of skills that are involved. Each moot um, will, like there's 
like I said, different subject uh, areas. There's an intellectual property moot, for instance. There's a there's business moots. There's different kinds, and students apply to be a part of those. And usually, uh, they work uh, with other law schools. So you will, you know, um, have the opportunity to to uh, go to moots that are held in Toronto or whatever different schools. Um, and usually they are moots, they're set up as if they are an appeal court. So you're in the position of having to put together an argument as if you're making an appeal to an appeal court. And so you, you develop and you present that. And there's competitive aspects for many of the moots. Um, we also have the Kawaskaman moot, which is intentionally not competitive, but rather uh, to look at other legal skills, uh, negotiation, reaching consensus, like building relationships. Um, and each law school uh, gets, whoever is hosting the Kawaskaman moot, they get to choose the, the legal problem. And so uh, over the years, the legal problems have included treaties, they've included uh, conflicts with um, resource companies uh, with uh, issues of membership and citizenship, uh, gender. There's a whole range of legal problems that students have um, been able to uh, take up. And then the processes for those moot are facilitated by the different law schools, usually with um, like either justices that volunteer or lawyers that volunteer. Um, so that there's support for the students as they, they complete the work. So uh, that's a very kind of general overview uh, of them. They're really important in terms of developing certain kinds of skill sets, advocacy skill sets. Thank you. Um, so I did the Kawashkaman Mu. I applied, I was, and I was lucky to get in. Um, so I did that in my second year, and I hear there's some timelines around mooting as well, um, that because of our program, uh, it's appropriate for us to moot in, in the second year. And so if that's something you're interested in, definitely take a look at what the opportunities are. Um, I also volunteered uh, this in my second year to do um, to do the, oh my goodness, I totally forget what it was called, but it was an international moot anyway. So like people were appearing in the International Court of Justice, I think it was. Um, and so just to understand like what a moot was, um, I, I did that volunteer work. So when I did the Kawashkaman Aboriginal moot, um, it was super awesome. Um, the process of getting the problem was very appropriate. So it was a, a, an Indigenous community, a Métis community, um, who was developing a COVID law for, for their community. And as COVID was new to everybody, we were all new to this problem. And so it was a, a great, great learning experience for everybody. Um, and so Belle talked about the teams. And so the University of Saskatchewan um, was the host for that last year um, and we would have went there had COVID not happened and we were all, you know, in our, in our homes. Um, but they, so they're supposed to, I don't, I don't know what the parameters around it are now and whether they're in person or not, but anyway. Um, so we got our problem. My teammate and I worked on, um, and you're divided, right? So in our group, at our table, um, we had representatives who were representing Canada. We had representatives who were representing the provincial government. Um, we had representatives who was representing the Métis community. Um, we had the RCMP represented, and then we had the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which was awesome because that's what our team got. And it was an amazing opportunity to put everything into practice that we've learned in this program. And so it really opened up the doors for us to be like, let's look at story, let's look at song, let's look at who, who the, this Métis community is and to be able to like extract those principles and put those, um, make sure that those were embedded into that law. Um, it was a little bit difficult in the sense that we were trying to tell the community what you should include. <laughs> Um, but a lot of the people who competed competed in that move um, were not Indigenous whatsoever, right? So I would say that 
there were 200 plus or minus 200 people involved in that moot. There were, I think, eight different tables, but there were teams from um, every university across Canada. Um, and a lot of them were, were not Indigenous, you know, like there was maybe a dozen of us that were actually Indigenous once we got into the larger group. Um, so a small percentage. So I was so thankful that we were able to present that on behalf of UVic to not only to say like, hey, this is what we're doing, but to have those non-Indigenous people a part of our group to, so that we could really show them you know, the value that, that this program has and how um, they can take it, you know, a different look and approach when they're, when they're dealing with Indigenous communities going forward. So if you like the advocacy piece and you want to be um, on your feet and making those arguments, like those are excellent opportunities um, for you to do. Thank you. Um, I have one thing that um, that I wanted to put out there that actually, Emma, thank you for bringing it up. Um, one thing we get asked a lot is um, talking about connection to community. That's part of your application to this program. So again, I'm wondering if I'm going to put it back out to Val and Ruth and Amanda and Rebecca. I guess what I'm thinking is, um, what is connection to community? Like, what are we talking about when we say that? And then why are we asking for that? as part of the application. I can uh, start and perhaps Ruth, you can, you can uh, add to it. So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, how the, the JID was, is conceived as something that has to matter to Indigenous communities. The whole program has to matter to Indigenous communities. Indigenous law has to matter not just to Indigenous communities, but to Canada. If Canada is truly going to be multi-juridical, then this program and others like it have to happen. So um, in thinking about um, who the students are that are, that are coming in, what we uh, hoped and, and what has happened uh, by and large for the, uh, the connections to communities is that people bring a wealth of background and experience, which then becomes part of the learning environment. Like learning itself is a collaborative uh, process. So, and then it's enriched by the different perspectives and different experiences. And we wanted uh, the students to be able to connect what they're learning to people that they care about, family, others that they where they come from. Um, we also know that many Indigenous peoples have been separated from their own communities through no fault of their own by the by the history of Canada. So you know, then we look at intent, we look at what have people done. Um, uh, are people uh, reconnecting if that's part of uh, their journey? Um, what we've seen over the years is that sometimes it's in uh, law school or in university, other programs where students finally have the support and the ability to reconnect and with who they are and where they come from. So, um, so the idea is that um, law is important to peoples, um, people are important to communities and vice versa in terms of um, the, the, the work, the degree, the students mattering beyond the university. Like our work has to matter outside of this place. And uh, so that's, um, that's a part of it. I mean, there's, um, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing um, consideration. Like we also have the Indigenous Law Research Unit, which we hire uh, as many students as we can for amazing uh, jobs. Um, and, you know, in, in looking at the research unit and who we hire, that community experience is, is important too. And because that experience will enable them, the students to connect with other communities uh, will, you know, it, it's, it's important to, to how the 
ideas and expectations that people have of indigenous communities. And, um, you know, all of that is, um, you know, it's, it's part of moving the indigenous law forward, but in a way that <clears throat> is supportive of peoples in a way that is supportive of families and connections. And so any way that we can do that, that's what we're gonna try and do. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with Val that, you know, when you, a lot of students say, you know, I haven't been engaged with specific indigenous community or the indigenous communities in my area, but I have been engaged with um, the Native Students Association at my university or what have you or I have been involved in this kind of activism. And it's really difficult to say this is what our, this is what the yardstick is, because again, we look at the applications holistically um, and to say that kind of discounts all the work that we do in reading through personal statements and looking at the GPAs and everything else. That's a whole part of who you are, who you show up as when you apply to be part of the program. Um, so I, I, when, I, when I'm looking at community engagement, I'm, I'm reading it through your personal statement. And a lot of the times in, in some of the experiences that you've had and how you talk about them. And I really look for um, an authenticity there um, as well as a humility in some ways. Like you have to be able to talk yourself up, but you also have to be humble and sometimes in the way that you bring those together. And some people come at it through sport and some people don't even see sport as a way in through the community, but it's such an important way in for so many people. So it's hard to say we look for this thing, we look for that thing, um, because I'd say for each of the applicants, it looks very differently. And some people who came in and spoke to me initially and said, I don't have any community involvement. And through conversation, I was like, well, that counts to me, that counts. Like we've all been um, dislocated, displaced, disconnected in various ways because of colonialism. And so we have to think through how it's affected us and how we can, how we can verbalize and connect that to our own connect, because we're all connected to communities in some way. It's just, what does that mean to us? And I think that's what we try to pull out is what does that mean to you? What is your commitment to it? And what is your passion behind it? I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask and just say for, um, well, actually, I shouldn't put you on the spot because I don't know this. I'm, I just made a huge assumption. Um, so let me put it back out to generally uh, and say, what about for, um, how would a, uh, a settler, uh, a non-Indigenous applicant uh, talk to communities? Same thing or, um, you know, are there other things we would be looking for? When, when students have come and spoke, spoken with me, sorry, Lori, I couldn't hear the first part of what you were saying. So I don't know if you were asking someone else specifically or what, but I'll just jump in. Um, when non-Indigenous students come and speak to me about community involvement, I, I basically tell them the same thing. Like, and if they ask, you know, what can they do now? Um, I mean, it is great. If you're, if you're just coming to this now, definitely connect with the reach. If you're at an institution, you have a Native Students Union, you have like probably some Indigenous office that has speaker series or something like that. There are Indigenous events happening at your institution. Um, I, don't, I don't see it as strong when I only see it in the past year. I mean, if it's just, oh, what do I need to do to get into the JDJID? and we say community engagement, and then all of a sudden in one year, you see a whole bunch of indigenous community engagement. Um, hey! <laughs> um, but at the same, like, I think if you're contextualizing your reasons for that, I think that's an important piece there. I think someone could have a story behind that, that I don't wanna say justifies, because that, that's judgy but um, that explains why in the past year they may have kind of come into it. And I think it's the story that matters to me when I'm reading it and I'm one person on the committee. But to me, when I see the story behind it and I see some truth there, I, I see some humility there and I see some passion there. 
um, that that's what does speak to me. So it's not to say if you've only become engaged in this work in the past year that I'm going to say no, um, but it's like, what is that reason? Like, what was that spark that happened? What was the spark? Why is it true now? And why haven't you been engaged previously? And if that seems like it's a fit for that cohort that year, and so that's another thing, right? It's, we're looking at the cohort. So when we're looking, we have 25 spaces. And as Rebecca said, we're not necessarily gonna fill those 25 spaces if we don't feel like the people coming, coming to the table are the right fit. Um, so it's all about that. There's a personality piece and a fit piece to it too. So it's, it's not a, a black and white kind of answer. I think I'm being very vague here. I'm not sure I'm helping these students. That was great, Ruth. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with my mic, uh, but that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, we have about four minutes left, so I'm going to open it up the floor, to the floor to the, to the students. Uh, if you have any questions, you've got a few minutes. Nicole, go ahead. Hey, uh, I was just wondering about opportunities for kind of like non-traditional classroom learning. Like, is there any uh, sort of like land-based courses that are offered or things in that vein? So uh, it depends, you know, the field schools are pretty, um, they, they're very different than what else happens in, in law school. I think that you would also find that even though the JID classes are happening in the law school, they're pretty different than the than a straight up JD course. Like so, you know, when I think of um, I think of Gixan uh, land and property and common law property. Yes, we look at the the common law. We look at the histories, but. You know, for the last couple of classes, students have had to read Gixan oral histories. They've had to do those analyses. They've had to put those up on the walls. They've had to think about, um, uh, you know, like what, what are the different legal meanings that come from those? And you're not going to get that in a regular classroom, right? So yes, we are in a classroom. The work we're doing is pretty amazing. You know, the students are pretty amazing in, in how they engage in that. So. Um, uh, some of the field schools uh, definitely have more of a land-based component to it. It's not the only way to learn Indigenous law. It's one of the ways. Um, and uh, it's, um, and I, I, I say that because it's really important to see a range of pedagogies and a range of different ways of engaging with Indigenous law. Um, and uh, so that's one of them, um, along with other ones. Yeah, and I, I just to uh, add to that too, uh, some of the field schools, I think a lot of people hear field school and they think land-based. Um, I, I would kind of maybe say more community immersed, um, which can include land-based or water-based learning, um, but sometimes they're not like land-based in the way that you might think of being on the land it's sometimes it's in the big house and it's sitting at the table with elders and it's having tea in their houses and so it's um it is it is a little different but um you know we are building a new wing um a new kind of area of the building that will allow for different kinds of learning than we have in our typical classrooms in the building that we have now but I know that many of the instructors have, like Sarah's taken, Sarah Morales has taken her students out to Cowichan um, to do like field trips for lack of a better term. And John takes, John Burroughs takes students out um, just outside the building onto the land. Um, David has taken students out to the court, to the jailhouse. And so I know that, that folks are, are doing outside of the classroom things as well, um, but might not be your typical land base. Um, like the expected romantic land-based idea that a lot of folks have. For sure. Thanks so much. That sounds great. I really appreciate your questions and your interest. Uh, I, it's lovely. So I hope to meet you. Uh, we all hope to meet you. Um, and thank you so much for your interest. <laughs>
it's, it's just so important and fabulous. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, a, a huge thank you to Val and Ruth and Amanda and Rebecca for taking time out of your very extraordinarily busy schedules to be here. Um, I'm just so honored that all, all of the other students are here as well. Uh, this is, this I have learned so much this evening from being present and hearing your questions and listening to the students and Val and Ruth. And I, this is just such an important conversation to have. I really am so pleased that you're all here. I see um, Emma has put my email in the chat. So if you have any questions or you want to reach out to anybody, uh, feel free to send me an email and we can make that connection happen for you. I also uh, just wanted to, to especially thank Rebecca and Amanda, as well as Ruth. And, you know, I, thank you for, I've learned a lot from you, uh, just in terms of your experiences and insights. Um, thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and um, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.